actor Zoe Robbins, who plays our fierce Two Rivers Wisdom, Nynaeve Almira, will be joining us. Plus, we'll be breaking down some exclusive behind-the-scenes footage and chatting episode four with our fellow Wheel of Time fans. And don't forget, stick around for some exclusive shots of next week's episode. Welcome to Amazon's official after show, Inside the Wheel of Time. I'm your host and innkeeper, Matt Hatch. Bonds are forged and broken. Let's get inside episode four. Moraine is healed. Logan kills Karine. Nynaeve channels and heals everyone. Matt, Rand, and Tom meet the Grinwells, and that doesn't end well. Darkness grows, Tom fights a fade, and is Matt a killer? Was Logan a false dragon? And will Perrin follow the way of the leaf? That's why I'm so glad I have Zoe Robbins, who plays our Two Rivers wisdom, Nynaeve Almira, to discuss how it all went down. Zoe, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. I really appreciate you being here. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. This is so much fun to honestly get a chance to sit down and and honestly not be live, because live's different. (laughs) Live can be a lot. How exciting was it for you to be cast as Nynaeve Almira in The Wheel of Time? Incredibly exciting, I think. The, I mean, obviously, this 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 job opportunity is, has changed my life. I remember actually getting the email with the audition, and I just had a, I don't know, I can't really explain the feeling that I had, but it felt right, whether it was spiritual or something. It's very rare that it happens, but I was just like, there was almost like this quiet confidence of, okay, yeah, the story and the character just resonated with me in a way that I haven't experienced before. I'm just, yeah, grateful to to be on this journey. How did your family react when they heard? There's a lot of screams. I remember actually, I have a, I have a, <laughs> I have a LA manager and a New Zealand agent and they both called me at the same time. We were on a group call and they let me know. You know, I was actually running out the door and so we could only talk for a little bit, like maybe it was like five minutes. I was like, okay, thank you. Oh my God, uh, thanks so much, bye. And then <laughs> my New Zealand agent, Colin, called me afterwards and he was just like screaming. He was like, <laughs> F word, F word, F word. <laughs> And I was just screaming back to him as well. So, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of cussing, a lot of swearing, a lot of uh, celebratory yells. There's so many amazing sets and locations, and you've spoken just about like the impressive artistry of this all. What are some of your favorite, you know, locations or sets from season one? The two rivers. Even yeah. for us now, it's very nostalgic. That was the first set that we were introduced to when we first got here, and it was just breathtaking is the word I would say. They literally built a village from the ground up, and it was just exactly how I imagined when I was reading through the script. So it was quite surreal walking around almost in your imagination, but it was happening in reality. And I think just specifically because of the journey that the characters go on to, that's a set and a location that I'll I'll always love. Yeah. How did it affect you when it was burned down then? Uh... Yeah, it was kind of shocking to to learn that they were actually doing that. Like, I think the amazing set designer and and the builders all spent months and months to bring it to life. And then we burnt it down probably a thousand times quicker than it took them to build. So I I don't know, it's quite insane, actually. But it's also nice validation of like, oh, we're really doing it. We're, We're really going all out. Now, I know you mentioned uh, that there was an essence of all of your characters and the characters that were cast, like something you've noticed. What is the essence of you that you discovered in Nynaeve? I think we share the same like want and desire to do right by people. I'm quite quite sensitive and that's sensitive to energies and I think Nynaeve is, is similar too. So I think the way she channels her emotions, I didn't realize that I was a big fan of anger, but I... Um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> There's a beautiful introduction into the first episode where you're speaking with Egwene about the symbolism of the braid. And so I have to ask you, what does Nynaeve's braid mean to her? I think it's a symbolism for unity and connection and belonging. Like, I love the idea of that it, it symbolizes, you know, a group of, of people who, like, no matter where your life takes you, they will always have your back and, and you can always expect them to be rooting for you and, and you do the same for them. I think that's really special. It's a lovely little community that the, that the women's circle is. I think that's what keeps Nynaeve grounded in a lot of very emotional circumstances and situations as she, she 
holds on to her braid for comfort or to express her anger as we see in various flips and tugs. It's a part of her being and, and who she is. Now, speaking of the braid, there's a moment in the first episode where we watch a Trolloc drag Nynaeve away by her braid. It's a crazy scene. I have to know because you eventually kill this Trolloc. What were those scenes like for you to shoot? They were very fun and, and incredibly intense. A lot of those we shot on location at 4am in a Czech forest in the middle of winter. I can't say I love night shoots, but what, what I really appreciate about them is the crew becomes, I don't know, like this united front in a way. There's this common understanding of, you know, we're all in this together. We're tired and hungry and we can't feel our fingers and our toes, but we're, we're doing this. We're doing this. Robert Jordan, I think, was really born to write. He taught himself to read at the age of four, and he was reading a couple of books a day and thought, I'd like to write like that one day. And finally, the moment came when he threw one across the room, thinking, I can do better than that. Thank you for coming back and being with us, Critter, Rima, and Daniel Green. How y'all doing? Awesome. <laughs> I, like the, uh, I appreciate that you're, you're bringing the double hand wave. I, I really appreciate that. Because at the end of this episode, I was getting all the chills. I was not expecting it. Nynaeve. Reactions. This is mid-season finale. What were you thinking? I feel like it's really hard not to love her. And after this episode, now we know that she's really going places. And it's just really exciting in this mid-season finale to see where those places are. I feel like whoever did the special effects for Lan's spurting throat, they went a little too hard because I was like, is Lan dead? There's no way he's coming back. And then of course, I shouldn't have discounted my girl Nynaeve because she came through. But yeah, that was a fantastic scene and it was so unexpected. This episode seemed to really be building forth like, okay, there are all these candidates for Dragon. And I keep trying to like put myself in the headspace of people who haven't read the books of like, what are they thinking now? Because the show is like setting up some some real scaly candidates. I almost feel like anyone can be the dragon. <laughs> like, I'm like <laughs> five, ten, you know, that's, it, it does feel a little bit fun as a viewer of like, what is going on? What does this all mean? You think it's obvious what this means with Nynaeve? Her being able to channel, do you think it's a surprise viewers out there? If they're paying attention, which I'm hoping not, none of y'all are on your phone, they definitely saw Nynaeve channeling coming doing the listening of the winds talked about all the way back in episode one. It's kind of just like that level of power feels like it's finally, like it matches in the the book right because Nynaeve in the books as well as someone who's just a force and that was certainly on display here. I want to kind of turn the conversation a bit to Loghain. We're introduced to Loghain in this episode from a performance standpoint. What performances hit you in episode four? Loghain's. The moment that he got gentled was so powerful. Just the, the look on his face, the tears coming from his eyes. It was so much all at once. You could like feel it happening as if it was you also sitting there just completely stoic while they're holding the shield on him. And then once his rescue team arrives, he just blasts through it. I could see Moraine was either thinking, is it actually him given his strength yeah. or not? Because it's Moraine and you can never really tell what she's thinking. But just given that strength, I was like, oh, wow, is he the fifth? No, I, I can't really tell. Before we move on. I think it's important to call this out for any of our new viewers out there. If you're wondering what this word gentling means, you've kind of heard us bring it up a couple times. Maybe you heard Tom bring it up. If a man can channel when he's cut off permanently from access to the source or that ability to channel, it's called gentling. And for a woman, it's actually called stilling. We're obviously introduced to Loghain right at the end of episode three. And then we see this cold open that happens where we get to at least understand maybe a little bit more about what he's thinking. How did that cold open hit you in episode four? It was probably my favorite cold open yet. I love how they characterized madness. They literally showed the madness. People like whispering into Loghain's ears. I definitely thought he was about to kill the king. And then when he doesn't, it adds 
adds so much to his character and you realize that all these people are talking about Loghain and like calling him this false dragon but maybe he is the false dragon but he's also seems to be like kind of a heroic character so that opening made the ending all the more tragic when you see him gentle that made it so much more sad because you realize he's kind of like a really good leader and maybe even a very good man. Nynaeve definitely stole the show at the end, but if it weren't for that, this would have absolutely been Loghain's episode. Yeah, there's so much to unpack there. The visualization of the voices speaking to Loghain, I loved. I don't know if you'd call that like the taint or the corruption, however you want to call it. Creating a face next to him and speaking to him. What were your thoughts there? I just want to say thank you for changing the name to The Corruption. That's a really good move <laughs> and a massive improvement from the books. I've always wondered how they're going to bring The Corruption into the show and how you visualize something that in the books is described as so palpably vile. And it actually feels yeah. that way. Watching it like crawl over and seep through the weaves, it did feel like that violation. So yeah, that, that yeah. pretty much was like, okay, yeah, I wondered how you're going to do that. And good job. <laughs> we do see him somewhat kind of act I don't know if it's heroically he's attacking this kingdom but he does heal the king does that set up the Aes Sedai as somewhat villains here at the end when they gentle him? I think Leandrin was being steered in that direction basically everything she did this whole episode made everyone suspicious Nynaeve included. <laughs> I mean, she she just went ahead and said, like, that woman's a snake. And I think we all saw that. Leandrin is making some moves that make her out to be a villain for sure. We got to know some of the other Aes Sedai, like Alana. I thought she was cool and relatable, you know, and she's got multiple warders and she stops arrows in the air. I wouldn't say all the Aes Sedai are being painted as villains, but the Red Aja... It doesn't look good right now. They don't look very nice. Let's put it that way. Going off what you said there, I really love how we're seeing the tower's conflicted internal mechanisms really brought mm. to the forefront. That's something that is yeah. so key to this story, how there's just corruption and selfishness. And we watch them gentle this man, cut him off from the source forever. Like as a viewer, it's kind of left with this feeling of like, where do you feel safe now? And as I, I've kind of hit on, like that's how it should feel being cast out in this world. Like there's so many different players maneuvering in so many different ways. And yeah, you just kind of feel for all these poor little farmers who just a week ago, with their biggest concern was like, oh, am I going to get a, a night with my love interest in the, in the farm? Now it's, am I going to get stabbed? Let's talk about this family, the Grinwells. And this is where this whole kind of conflict comes in all about, is Matt somebody that can be trusted? When Matt is seen standing in that room with the fade, do you believe that Matt killed that family? They definitely lingered a little bit too long on Matt. And I was like, wait a second. There was a lot of moments in this episode where I was like, wait a second, they're not going to do that. And they didn't with Matt, or did they? I don't know. I feel like they did a great job of like setting it up where was he already there when the Fade got there? I don't know. I think they it's pretty ambiguous at this point, to be honest. you got to give me a thumbs up or thumbs down on this. Do you think yes or oh, no? Where are you I have... Matt, that's mean. <laughs> Come on, all the viewers are watching now. They're asking themselves the same. Okay, Critter's a no on that one. I don't think it was him. I, I, the true crime <laughs> fan in me is like, where's the blood? You know, there was a lot of blood. And I feel like Rand would have noticed. You know, somebody would have noticed blood on him. You know, there, it was everywhere. And also, I just, you know, I love Matt. I can't believe that it was him. And, and I feel like if we would have gotten a little better look at him, we would know. And that feels intentional, but I love it because it's so dramatic. Just to make everyone mad, I'm going to say he definitely did it. It's just 100% <laughs> him. Uh, he actually knows he did it. And he's just lying. No. Um, really, the biggest like takeaway from that scene for me, though, is just watching Tom be able to put up like a fight against a fade for yeah. a little bit. Enough for the guys to get out of that shed. It was just like a, okay, Tom's here to play. Let's go. I love seeing this old man with some knives be able to defend himself for a little chunk. Yeah, I liked how he was chucking them. And then he like was grabbing more <laughs> i was like tom you're out of no you're not you have no, you're not. Uh, not. <laughs> See, we like, knew okay. we knew that he was dangerous remember because nothing's more dangerous than a man who knows the past and here he comes wielding knives so he uh <laughs> really worked out he knows through his yeah. history that fades worst nightmare is a guy with a lot of knives <laughs> when it comes to perrin and Egwene. They're just kind of hanging out with Tinkers. But I did see kind of a question that was asked to Perrin. So I'm going to ask you this. Do you think Perrin is convinced by the way of the leaf? I think because of what happened back at the Two Rivers, he likes the idea of it. He's tempted by the fact that had he been following the way of the leaf, 
that never would have happened. Mm. But I think the logical side of him is also thinking, well, had I been following the way of the leaf, the Trollocs would have killed us all anyways, you know? So it, there, there's just this cognitive dissonance with him. He wants things to be better, obviously, because he's really going through a lot understandably, I don't think he's going to land on the way of the leaf as the solution, even if for the moment it seems somewhat tempting. I've never liked the way of the leaf people. It's the tinkers here. I was like, yeah, I feel about them the same way I do in the book. It's like you have a really nice view of the world, but you know, murder all. So I don't agree. I think there needs to be some violence. I saw that hurt your heart, Rhythma. How are you feeling at this moment with what Daniel just said about the tinkers? I mean, I really like the tinkers, but maybe I am a little bit idealistic where I'm like yeah if we all just like got together nothing would be bad but obviously the world is not like that I think there is courage in sticking to your guns and you know sticking to a way of life that might not be easy or understandable to everyone but still choosing that yeah. and I think that's the, there's a lot of bravery in that but it is definitely very idealistic I agree with you. I think that was kind of a beautiful way to say it. You know, yeah. there's a certain bravery of conviction here with this is the way they want to live their life. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Daniel's still not convinced. He's like, bravery, no. schmavery. <laughs> I love that because I was totally hook, line, and sinker. I was like crying when she was doing her little monologue about her daughter. I cried, but I like how we're on different ends of the spectrum when it comes to this. Daniel really hates the tinkers. <laughs> <laughs> Was, I don't hate them. Was, I think they're really yeah, solid yeah. people. Aram was so charming, and I was just like, oh, my God, you're adorable. But I'm just sitting here like, no, <laughs> you're just not. it's not going to work at all. It's not even going to have a remote chance of lasting. I wanted to jump back just for a moment, something that hit me at least. The warders, they were just sitting down, chatting, talking about their role in this and how they're not just forced into this, if you will. Like this is a choice that they've made and it's a companionship, if you will. What did you take away from that, that discussion of warders in episode four? I think for me, it just turned them into real people. At times reading the book, you hear hear about the warders and they're just like these wolf-like, you know, predators who walk in a certain way and are hard to see and are great at fighting, right? So they're like objects. They're they're sidekicks. They're they're pushed to the side. These guys though, you got to know them and and it, they were real people and they were cool and you wanted to hang out with them and you were kind of jealous of Nynaeve and 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 it was just it was great. I really enjoyed that scene because there wasn't anything really like that in the books and and it just reminds you that yeah no all these people are well real in the in the show they're real they're real in the world of the wheel of time and they're all really nice and and they have this epic calling that they're totally bound to but happy happy to have so i thought that was great as far as final thoughts uh daniel episode four mid-season finale how's this going for you i got the the biggest laugh out of me came from when nynaeve realized that there's warders hooking up with the ice to die and it apparently <laughs> bothered her a lot <laughs> that was just a moment i wanted to talk about this episode so i took my excuse and ran with it um, love it no, but yeah. the, in terms of a mid-season finale i imagine especially for first-time viewers into the wheel of time world this is an ending that's going to leave them with a lot of questions what does it mean when an Aes Sedai dies Karini's death and Stepan's reaction to that maybe explain how you were feeling about it I mean earlier on in the episode we hear Stepan say that the bond between an Aes Sedai and her warder is deeper than a parent and their child or a husband and their wife I think something this episode does really well is exploring the different types of warder bonds Lan and Moraine have one type of warder bond where it's still intimate but it's not sexual in any nature but they're there are warders who have relationships with their Aes Sedai and there are other warders who have like a different dynamic. Each bond is unique and the only sort of similarity is the depth of it and how much it means to those individuals. To see Stepan lose his Aes Sedai and just kind of go berserk over her death was pretty impactful. The biggest thing that I can't stop thinking about is What's going on with Matt? I just want to see what's going to happen next with our boy Matt because he's one of my faves and I worry for him. He's broody Matt now and I want Matt to be better. I think that's a great way to end this. We want Matt to get better. Until <laughs> yes. next time. <laughs> I can't wait to find out. Looking forward to how that turns out. Can't wait to talk about episode five with you all here soon. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Bye. 
So my favorite quote when I was working on the Wheel of Time became something that Lan says, duty is heavier than a mountain, death is lighter than a feather. Writing the Wheel of Time, I felt duty being heavier than a mountain. And the idea of letting the project go someday would feel very light, that it would be Rafe's deal now. And I'm excited to see the things that he's talked about coming to fruition as he actually makes the show. There's so much more behind the scenes content where that came from. So make sure to check it out on X-Ray as you watch the Wheel of Time on Prime Video. To access it, press up on your Fire TV remote or tap your mobile device while watching the Wheel of Time. There's an incredible scene where Nynaeve saves Lan's life and the life of many others in this incredible moment of channeling. What does it mean to be playing someone with such an ability to heal? I think what it reinforces is that there's nothing weak about being kind and looking out for, for people you love. I'm hesitant to say saint-like because she's deeply flawed, but just, just the way that she puts the people she loves before her own needs is, is something that I've just... I find completely honorable and, and um, yeah, she's, she's told me a lot about life. What's it been like to have been away from home and working in Prague? Any funny stories from the set, you know, things that you get to do outside of just being naive? You know, Prague is like our second home now, this very quirky, obscure, <laughs> funny city. I've met some of the most amazing people here. As, as you guys know, we've, we've filmed throughout the pandemic and experienced lockdowns together. So we were all filming and going straight home and then getting up and filming again. And this, you know, our community became very small. The Wheel of Time family was our bubble for a long time and that just reinforced the bonds and, and, the, and the friendships that we have. You know, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I, I, I love them, you know, yeah. um, the cast yeah. in particular. In terms of funny stories, there's, <laughs> there's honestly never a dull moment with, with Maddie and, and Marcus and, and everyone, to be honest. On the day that I, we did the Trolloc fight, that was a whole day in the studios, actually, so they had built this cave. It was like a heated pool, which initially the first hour was nice, but after, you know, eight hours fighting a man in a Trolloc costume, you, it's, you're exhausted. <laughs> right, right, I was right. on about three Red Bulls, and I'm not, I'm not an energy drink drinker, so you could, that, can, that gives you an idea of how, how we were going for it. Um, but <laughs> it's poor, poor stunt guy. We were doing this fight sequence, and, and obviously... We had rehearsed it a bunch of times, but without water. And water gotcha. changes gotcha. your movements and, and you, you are much slower. And so we're having to fiddle with things throughout the day. But at the end of the fight sequence, there's a moment where both Nynaeve and the Trollic go underwater and you're kind of questioning who makes it out alive. And yeah. Nynaeve comes out triumphantly gasping for air. But how that actually went <laughs> in real life was this poor guy in the, the Trollic suit, I mean, that amazing these suits but i don't think they're necessarily made to be used underwater so what was happening was we were fighting and he was gradually filling up <laughs> with water to the point where oh he became God. buoyant he actually started like tipping back and gurgling oh semi-drowning dare i say it so i had to um, flip him back over <laughs> so he wasn't being consumed by this pool of water so i had to i had to save a trollic in real life <laughs> the, the trollic you just killed, you saved. Murdered, yeah. <laughs> you said it's been an absolute gift to play uh, such a complex and flawed and detailed character. What's the wisdom that you're walking away with as having played Nynaeve? Her personal journey in, in season one is, uh, I think a lot of it is, is, is around the need to, to let go and surrender and give up what you can't control in life. And that's been something that I've had to learn myself it's almost reinforced as, as an actor you know this this career is such a giant mess of of unknown and, and uncertainty and so I think for me as, as Zoe I've been trying to grasp on to to anything that I can have have a, a facade of, of you know the idea of control whereas yeah. you know the last two years in the pandemic and and, and all the atrocities that we've experienced as, as society and, and the world has just reminded me that there is nothing that we can control except our our actions and how we treat people. This just reminded me um, just of the things we learn through the Wheel of Time and our interactions with fellow fans and, and uh, friends we meet along the way. A good friend of mine uh, now, someone I've met through talking about the Wheel of Time, Jenny, and I wanted to share this with you. She called up and just 
expressed how much uh, appreciation that she had that her favorite character in the wheel of time looked like her and so Aww. i just I had to share that with you that she 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 found that so uh, uh motivating and so uh, appreciative and so just know you have big fans out there in in you and in nynaeve and i know they can't wait to see you here uh, in the wheel of time so well thank you so much thank you for sharing that i feel i feel the same way i'm happy to be a part of this and i know i know the wheel of time and, and nynaeve and a lot of characters mean mean the world to to many people a lot of you have grown up with with this world and it's been people's escape and, and motivations for for their lives and i'm just yeah really grateful to to be a part of that yeah, we're grateful to have you here. I, I kind of w- want to end us off in our, our chat here. I just want to ask you, can you describe where your character is at in three words at the end of season one? Confused. Angry. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's such a cop-out, angry. <laughs> um, and curious. Okay, no, there's, I love it. There's a, there's a lot going on for, for a lot of people at the end of, end of the season. It's epic. I'm, I'm very excited for people to see it. Thank you so much, Zoe, for joining us inside the Wheel of Time. Really appreciate you being here. Matt, nice to talk to you again. You too. Bye. Now here's a look at what's to come in episode five of the Wheel of Time. Will any more Aes Sedai be killed? Is the Dark One's corruption consuming Matt? And will Tom survive the fade? Has Perrin been taken in by the Way of the Leaf? And with Loghain gentled, is Nynaeve the Dragon Reborn? Find out this Friday when the next The Wheel of Time episode drops. Don't forget to hashtag your reactions throughout the season, and we'll do our best to feature your comments in next week's episode. And here is what you all had to say. Dali has tweeted, I am just done with the Wheel of Time fourth episode, and that was incredible. I am really impressed, Alvaro Morte. You nailed it. I never doubted you'd give a great performance, but to actually see it and be blown away by your talent was something else. I loved his performance too, and I can't wait to see what Alvaro brings next to a gentled low gain. Inkstain Cloud tweeted, Absolutely obsessed with the battle and action scene choreography of the Wheel of Time. Yeah, watching the Green Aja in battle, especially Priyanka as Alana, was a spectacle. I cannot wait for more. Ace Band tweeted, Anyone else get chills when Leandrin said, Let the hand of the tower fall on you, Loghain Ablar? Though it did give me chills, I can't wait to see what the Amarlin has to say. Kimmy Widdens tweeted, Oh God, episode four got me holding back the tears. Nynaeve having her moment just completely overwhelmed me. Zoe Robbins is playing her incredibly well. Just awesome when characters are brought to life so well. Won't forget this episode for a long time. I couldn't agree more. Zoe Robbins is making the world fall in love with Nynaeve. That's it, my friends. Remember, we want to hear from you every week. So hashtag your comments so we can share them on the show. And be back here next Tuesday for more interviews and behind the scenes looks with the cast and crew. I'm your host and innkeeper, Matt Hatch. Thank you for joining us inside the Wheel of Time. Whoa, oh my God. I see the See you later. We have to try everything. Drink. Hello. I don't care about the show. I just want a good blooper reel. I want to learn science. (laughs) You guys are going to make me look like I'm in the show, right? You're gonna put in the effects. Replace the green. I don't want to look like an asshole here. Sorry.